Hello, my name is Joe Hadzima. I'm senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management, and I organized this course, Nuts and Bolts of New Ventures, along with Jos Bonson, who will be speaking next about people. Jos Bonson is lecturer at MIT Media, Arts, and Sciences. He was a former lead organizer of what was then the MIT 10K competition. In fact, in the first year of the competition as a participant, he submitted over 20% of the entrants in that competition. He's been very actively involved in the MIT entrepreneurial community, uh, putting together teams of people and generally providing continuity and glue across the whole institute. Um, he had a major participation in the MIT Founder Study uh, by Bank of Boston, and uh, where he's worked a lot with the MIT Enterprise Forum, both on the global board and in the Cambridge chapter. Uh, because of his active involvement in, with people in the MIT community and in starting companies, he's the go-to person to discuss people and organizational issues for our nuts and bolts class. So without further ado, let's hear what Yost has to say. Let's get going with uh, all things people. Joe, yesterday, pointed out that when I was in your seats as a student, I had entered MIT's entrepreneurship competition many times. Turns out, uh, eight times in one year. And none of them made it past the, the initial screening. And of course, my attitude about this is like they can't recognize genius. So I, I at first. But then I came to appreciate that I had made some really dumb mistakes. Because I'd emphasized in my mind the power of the idea, that the high concept is what really mattered. And instead of teaming up with others who complimented me, who could add what I didn't have as an engineer, as an undergrad, didn't have experience, I didn't have the business chops, I didn't have a sense of salesmanship, I didn't have an understanding of all the things that you've heard about from Joe and Bob, both yesterday and today. And you'll hear from our other colleagues over the course of the remaining four nights. I had done a whole pile of things entirely alone, because it was easier as an engineer to solve problems by myself, instead of having to do the headache of coordination, of getting other people to do pieces, and then being disappointed that they didn't deliver. Right? And that focus on solo performance is, of course, what gets lots of people uh, a long way in an academic environment. But these are disastrous tendencies when it comes to building anything where the consequences, the output, is greater than the work any one individual can do. And I have my own painful lessons on that front. So when, a few years later, I stepped up to the plate and became a lead organizer of the entrepreneurship competition, I tried to do things a little bit differently. And here, just to give you a sense of my period of time running this thing, here are some of the, the ventures that emerged. The harmonics, I hope many of you know about. This is a Media Lab spinoff, Guitar Hero, rock band. It was two lab mates who had enough, having done their master's degree, they said, OK, no more. We want to take these big ideas about having music and machine and get them to everybody. We want to spread the idea. And video games seem like a good way to do it. Mimeo's our live case study. It was virtual link at the time. Yonald, who will be here on the last night, actually entered not just three times, but, but over the course of three different years. His first year, he was like me. He entered three ideas, each alone pitching the idea as a high technical concept. He wrote a grant proposal, essentially, saying, here, this is a good idea. It's worth funding. What he realized the second go around, three years later, is that going wide on many ideas is not nearly as powerful as concentrating on your best idea. Furthermore, he ran it by one of his old buddies as an undergrad who was back for grad school. This is a Sloan MBA. And Mike Dixon had a much better sense of well, what are people willing to put money on the table for of all these problems, which do people have the highest need for. So he was, in some sense, a very small preliminary market segment. And indeed, Mike ended up teaming up with Yonel to do this 
as a class project. In the beginning, it was just a school thing. Mike had other ambitions in life. He wanted to work for a big company. The family had obligations. But Yano generalized his own personal lesson, which is not just Mike. It was other people on the technical and business side that he needed to rope in. So by the time they were winning in that year's entrepreneurship competition, there was a handful of people on that team. And even then, after graduation, a few people went off to different goals, and it was a much smaller core group that was the, the actual founders. Now, what's amazing about Yonald's session on the final night, next week, Thursday night, is that he shows you, funding round by funding round, what happened to him and his co-founders from a financial point of view. What was their relative stake in this booming business that ultimately grew to have an amazing valuation and what was the downside when things started to not go well? Which is why it's an amazing and live case study for us. It's understandable by everybody, the whiteboard tracking scheme. But it's also an example from, uh, you know, of, of the team learnings. Uh, Banta, NetGenesis, NetGen was the first publicly traded MIT alum co. But both Banta and NetGen were fraternity brothers. In other words, it was a living group association that enabled them to get to know each other and them to trust each other enough to say, hey, we want to start a venture together. With active impulse systems, it was lab mates, chemistry. These are people who had built a machine and were already making money using the machine on a consulting basis for clients. So they had some sense of who wanted it, but they knew each other by virtue of lab uh, living. In the sensible technologies case, you had a hybrid. It was both a dorm room founded thing uh, as well as something that ended up becoming Tom Massey's master's thesis. So out of the what's now CSAIL, Computer Science Artificial Intelligence Lab. That's the first popular uh, haptic touch feedback device. Anyways, these are just some of the new codes from that year. And they all have an interesting team story. And so it's to help you think about what's your team story that we have tonight's session. I later, uh, well, first as part of being a, a running this entrepreneurship competition, I had a frustration, which is that we barely knew our own history. And so I ran this founders project to document, to do a census of all MIT-related startups ever from the very beginning. And that work was initially published by Bank Boston. And what we discovered is that thousands of alums had banded together to found companies that were employing at least a million plus people with, at that time, this is now 20 years ago, uh, at least a quarter of billion, uh, sorry, quarter trillion dollars of aggregate annual revenue. And now, my colleagues at Sloan, at Roberts and his team, think I undercounted. So their subsequent work thinks these numbers are even bigger. The key thing from doing this kind of research is to better understand the big picture about patterns of entrepreneurial action. Where does it happen? What's the average team size? What's the average distribution of experience and age? What's the composition of the team, technical, other? That's one of the positive lessons. So this, I would argue to you, is big picture learnings about what the broad population of your peers, predecessors, if you will, have done in starting, building, and growing their businesses. And also, it should give you some sense of the distribution of venture types. And the things that we see that are very visible and the dominant contributors to those big numbers are the several hundred largest companies, the ones that have grown the most dramatically since their founding. But it turns out there's a long tail. Thousands of our grads have gone on to start much more modest-sized businesses. It's the architect with their practice. It's the consultant advisory service. That's so small. Some people call them mom and pop shops. But that's a perfectly legitimate thing that actually the majority in number terms of our entrepreneurs have actually done. It's a rare but important subset that started as a consulting practice and then turned it into a product or, uh, or scalable productized service, software, hardware, whatever. Just to give you one example, Bob Metcalf, the inventor of Ethernet, uh, or in other words, the first really broadly popular computer networking protocol, uh, started his 3Com venture as a 
networking advisory service, and then turned it into a hardware business. Who did he start it with? His classmates and his old fraternity brothers. Those are the people he knew who had skills in the domains he didn't have some savvy about. But he's a case instance of that approach. Now, to give you some sense of the landscape, and we're talking about entire industries founded by our predecessors. Right? You'll notice the, the biotechnology industry, the semiconductor industry, the advanced uh, electromechanical devices industry, big swaths of enterprise software. Right? This is compelling stuff. The impact these people have in life is, is really important. And so learning lessons from them is also, I would argue, equally important. In my own case, I want to give you my counterpoint. Not this big picture stuff, but what I decided to do is sort of prime startup out of my second go around at school. Uh, and that's having come here as an engineer, soaking up the amazing ethos of learning by doing and making things. That's the essence of this place. Men's and minus, mine and hand, weaving it together, being a builder of stuff and hanging out in places like MITRE's. This is the Electronics Research Society where a dozen different startups have been born. So this is one thing that I had in my mind. The second thing I had in my mind is learning. Because as a kid, I didn't speak English. I grew up in the Netherlands and spoke Dutch. And I actually learned how to read in the first place by reading a lot of these European comics, like Asterix, Tintin, etc. And then when we migrated to this country, this is an epic thing in its own right, the capacity of this country to absorb talent from around the world. Well, I learned English by reading the English versions of the Dutch comics. In other words, picture, pictographic, graphic novels, comics, was an amazing tool for teaching. And so my ambition for many years, and then finally it crystallized, was what if we married these two together? What if we use this approach to teach learning by doing, to teach maker skills? Fast forward to the punchline, we started how tunes, cartoons that show you how to make things. So here's an example how Toon shows kids how to take a soda bottle, turn it into a submarine. All right, the details of the project are unimportant, but the idea is powerful. How did I manifest this idea? Because I'd been thinking about it for a long time. I finally pitched it to one of the engineers at the Media Lab. I said, hey, what do you think about using cartoon? You know, I gave him the sales pitch, and he's like, ah, oh, you mean like reached up on his bookshelf and pulled down a book from 100 years ago. It was something like, you know, the young, young lad's illustrated mechanic, boy-oriented stuff. And we said, why don't we do the same thing, only instead of it being boys only, let's have it be kids broadly. And also, let's make it ultra-affordable. Yes, 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 yes. Escalate, and then what? We start doing a whole pile of things. We rope in the user, that's Max, who wanted to build things. We were up in the purchaser. It's Mark, his dad, because Max wasn't going to buy these things, but his dad might. We had lots of prototypes of things that one might do, which is a necessary thing for everybody. It's to sort of, hey, let's try. The, what would you build if you could use cartoons? We roped in. This is an important part of the story. It's not just co-founders. It's also the larger food chain. This is our lawyer. Right? And he didn't want to be our lawyer until he vetted us, just like we had to vet him. So he came, the photo is from MITRE's, MIT Electronics Research Society. He came to check us out in our home venue because it was a two-sided vetting. We wanted to get to know him. He wanted to get to know us in our seriousness. Now, Saul and I were both engineers, really, but I was, at that point, in Sony. I was in the Saul Fellows Program. Saul was a doctoral student in mechanical engineering, but a media lab guy. Well, we needed a third party. You understand, the, that's not enough to make cartoons. We needed the artist. And Nick Dragata in the middle had followed in the footsteps of Kirby and Hal Foster giants of graphic novels. He's an artist, a comic book guy, a professional Marvel illustrator who had Spider-Man books and others under his belt. The three of us were the core founding crew. And, and it was not the first artist we roped in. I actually recruited another doctoral student here, Solar Olegbefua. 
who was a comic book artist for the, the tech. But he wasn't motivated. The timing was wrong. It wasn't his thing. You understand, sometimes the early recruits don't work out. And it didn't with solar. We tried various mechanisms, ultimately honed in on Nick. That's a longer story. But the key point is that trifecta allowed us to sort of do the early stuff of testing and iterating and then ultimately escalating. And that story is what I want to share with you today. Because you've seen already from Joe's talk yesterday a whole slew of examples of where people matter. It's that slice of the business plan stack. It's that chunk of summarizing who are you, why should people care. It's this chunk of things that, that the, your reader has to find believable. It's the, 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 what, what, what is it about your people that makes them interesting? It's, it's outsider. It's not just those who are together working on the plan. It's people who you ask for advice from. It's, it's believability. It's, it's these things that all matter. So, OK, we want to help you do this. And this is a nuts and bolts of new ventures, so I'm hopefully conveying some more practical stuff. Because, well, for example, you know, it's not natural for me to be sociable. I actually don't like it. For me, going to social events and schmooze gatherings this is just painful work. If I don't already know somebody there, this is very daunting. Right? I may have to work myself up to get excited about this stuff. Alcohol helps, but it's not the only, uh, and sometimes unwise. <laughs> so why? Well, I hope it's, it's obvious, but I would just want to reinforce that everybody has strengths and weaknesses. And when you band together with others who have strengths that complement you, that is to say they are strong in some of the ways that you may be weak, then you're really firing on all cylinders. The archetypes of this are things like, some people say you need a hustler, a salesperson, and a hacker, a builder. Some people say, well, you need somebody who's outward facing and people who are inward facing. Sometimes inward facing means they're operational. They like to figure out how to make it work. They like to rally the team. But they're not good sales, or they're not good promoters, or they're not good conveyors of the vision to people with money or other resources that are needed. Whatever combination. I mean, all of those combinations have been manifested in dozens of companies. But what's your combination? And so there's a, a, a premium here on self-assessment. What are you strong at? What are you not at? And ideally, you don't just introspect. You get others to convey their understanding about you. In other words, you need to count on others for honest advice and feedback about what you're strong at and what you're not. And by the way, this is um, a repeated game. That is to say, you're not only doing this now for whatever venture you're hoping to do next, but these are relationships and connections that will bear fruit and be useful to you over the long haul. OK, this is incredibly unlikely. Drew Houston, who founded Dropbox, essentially got married on the first date. He met the person who had become his co-founder, and they instantly agreed to work together and sign founding documents. I give you the link to the, to the video and the Stanford page just because of how ridiculously lucky he was that this first engagement was a good one. Because the dominant mode is that the first people you're thinking of working with, for various reasons, that's, that relationship doesn't work out. You know, and of course, there are the malicious end of things. The person's a liar. But that's rare. What's actually much more likely is some combination of you know, the timing doesn't work out. Your risk profile, right? a person's willingness to accept risk, their cash flow needs. I mean, if you're dealing with partners who are amazing, but they're in a financial pinch for whatever reason, family, other, health, who knows? There are many reasons why the timing and the person are wrong. He, on the other hand, got really lucky. <laughs> Don't count on that. Fine. What's another good example? And this actually, I think, around academic parts is the dominant mode. Dave Packard on the left, Bill Hewlett on the right, uh, connected with one another as undergrads at Stanford. Then they split apart. And Hewlett actually came here to do work in making electronic equipment. Turns out coming here mattered, because that electronic equipment that he did for his master's thesis became the first product of the joint company. And by the way, they successfully resolved their first potential dispute. What do we call the company? Should it be Packard Hewitt or Hewlett Packard? 
Turns out they use the dispute resolution mechanism of a coin flip to decide. So Hewlett Packard. Now, turns out there's another really important person in the mix, another MIT alum, Fred Terman. This guy on the right was not only their electrical engineering instructor, but Terman was a giant in the world of, of building up the venture ecology of Stanford. He ran the Stanford Industrial Park with the eye on recruiting alum companies to be home quartered next door to the university, to not only provide rent income to Stanford, but to send students to Stanford for distance education. And by the way, to encourage a larger tie. Because remember, Stanford at that point, this is the 1940s. This whole area of Santa Clara Valley was apricot orchards. The dominant economic mode was farming and ranching. Terman had a vision that that area could become something else. That's why it's called the father of what's now known as Silicon Valley. Well, uh, the, 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 the details are glorious, but not relevant for today. So I leave them as links for you to follow. That's the heart of the Stanford Industrial Park, which arguably is the heart of Silicon Valley. Why is it called Silicon Valley? Well, it turns out it's yet another alum founder story, but in this case, not so pleasant. The guy in the middle there, together with his two colleagues, Bardeen and Bertain, the guy in the middle of Shockley, all physicists. At that time, they're working in a corporate lab, Bell Labs. And they have the amazing discovery invention of, uh, well, you use sort of semiconductor, it's the essential element of semiconductor electronics, huh? transistor. Uh, and, and Shockley uh, says, let's commercialize this. All that's left of his work is this parking lot in Silicon Valley. But in 1956, they started the very first semiconductor silicon company in Santa Clara Valley. Now, why is this interesting? Because Shockley was a horrible manager and a terrible people person, and he irritated everybody on the team. That's why these eight left. They quit in frustration and started a new company called Fairchild. So in there lies a double story. One, Shockley had it all. He had, it was a Nobel Prize winning inventor, founder of the pioneering company in the field, but couldn't organize and retain talent. The talent, on the other hand, was not stupid. These were people who had gotten to know each other and admire one another's skills, and they had different skills. Uh, you had some people who would later become pioneers in the venture capital area. Kleiner from Kleiner Perkins is one of those. Anyways, the key point is that the one in the middle, Bob Noyce, was the one who was the rallying force behind this team leaving and engaging with a venture investor. It turns out they didn't get venture capital. They instead convinced Sherman Fairchild, who was running a camera instrumentations business, to create a corporate venture. In other words, it was a risk mitigation move. They didn't have a brand new startup with very risky capital. They were a subsidiary, a branch of an established business. And by the way, for many of you, that actually may make sense. Corporate venturing is a perfectly legitimate alternative way or pathway to the world of new venturing. Anyways, the Fair Children, they're called, because these founders were the creators of Fairchild, Bagat Moore. And I, I give you just this one rendering showing the intellectual heritage of the many companies in Silicon Valley tracing their lineage back to Fairchild. Why? This, this is not about core ideas, because everybody had the same pool of ideas. It's about talent, about people meeting each other of people saying, who could I do something with next? Who, who do I want to do something so bold and risky as quit my paying job and go do something a bit different? Same genre of industry, but something far more risky. Well, you know the story, Noyce and Gordon Moore of Moore's Law uh, were the key co-founders, together with a few others, of Intel. And uh, yeah. Let's uh, bring it more towards where we are. Um, this crew is really representative of a goal that I hope many of you have, namely to weave together whoever temporarily or permanently is motivated by your venture concept. This fantastic team of people were the winners. You see, they have the $100,000 grand prize check as given by 
Vinod Khosla, venture capitalist, co-founder of Sun, spinoff from Stanford. Um, the organizers of the 100K were those at the periphery, but all those people in the middle were the team that assembled for the purpose of the competition. Now, were they all motivated to go on and do the company? No. Turns out Ella, the woman on the far, le far left, was the architect designer of the enabling first version of the solution. But she had her own venture concept, which is what she was really working on. But she was willing to work with these guys because they flew her to Kenya, which is where the venture was going to be. Similarly, uh, the two guys next to her were undergrad engineers. They weren't about to drop out in order to do this venture, but they were really motivated by the mission. These guys are solving sanitation in slums around the planet, starting in Nairobi, Kenya. This is huge. Uh, we're talking about many, many, many people ha have a need for a solution to, their, to this problem. Well, uh, Nathan Cook dropped out, actually quit his MIT D-Lab job in order to join the founding team. And then the three MBAs forsaked McKinsey offers and other, you know, the obvious things that one does as a graduating MBA with a debt load, because they said this matters. But they didn't do it without a lot of work and preparation. Not just winning the $100,000 through this entrepreneurship competition. They applied for and secured a substantial fraction of the available grant financing, free money, that was here in this sort of Boston metro ecosystem. They didn't just stop at MIT boundaries. They went up to Harvard, extracted Harvard money for an MIT spinoff, they got mass challenge money. In other words, they said, okay, while we're here in this incredible supportive environment, we're gonna max out on all of our options. And that's why roving in a distributed team mattered because not all those people needed to join the company. For them, it was a learning experience. The engineering guys, I, this, is, this is field practice, highly complementary to the theory and book learning they're, in, they're getting in their classes. So they were motivated to join for a different reason than founders' shares. Let's uh, generalize a little bit. You should recognize most of these venture names. I won't spotlight all of them, but I, I do want to point out their founding team story. Bose, the speaker's business, was Professor Bose and his first student, Sherwin Greenblatt. And by the way, Greenblatt is giving, paying it forward. He now runs the Venture Mentoring Service, which is a structured organization that anybody with an MIT connection can take advantage of. Gillette, Joe mentioned perhaps one of the most famous business models, razors and blades. He gets genius to, to practically give away the permanent piece and make all your money on the consumable. Problem is, the guy with the idea, King Gillette, was a bottle cap salesman. He could spin a story about why men should ritually self-mutilate, mutilate, right? Why we should shave. But he couldn't actually make the blades cheaply or sharp enough. That's where the MIT alum comes in. William Emery Nickerson, metallurgist, solves the problem. Those two create the American Safety Razor Company. But they're not stupid. King Gillette was an incredible salesman. So they renamed the company Gillette not too long later. And it was that enabling underlying technology of cheap, sharp blades that makes that business model actually plausible. Well, let's see. Just a couple others. Akamai, lab mates. Teradyne, founders DeWolf and Darbalov sat alphabetically next to each other in ROTC class. Digital equipment, lab mates from Lincoln Labs. Analog devices, Matt Lorber and Ray Stata were both at Baker House, an undergrad dormitory together. That's how they got to know each other. And I mentioned these places where people get to know each other, lab, living, other, because that's half of the challenge in deciding whether you really want to do something with somebody else, is who do you know well enough to make this enormous leap with, to get something started and to take risks together. I mean, you, you have to cover each other's back in some deep fundamental sense. Well. The venturing process is think about something, make it, figure out how to get some money, and then repeat. This repeat part is an important thing because it's one of the moral underpinnings for behaving well all along because you're going to repeatedly count on the people that you're working with. You may not want to work with them again, but others will ask about your reputation from the people you worked with. Now, it should be ethical 
on some, I hope, other more fundamental grounds. But this social reason is an incredibly powerful reminder that you want to be a good person because this is something many of you will cycle through again and again. The idea of being a serial entrepreneur means to do it again. Even if you fail the first time, do it again. Did race data succeed with analog devices? What's today a $35 billion market cap chips business as his first venture? That's why there's this data center? No. His first venture was with Matt Lorber, and they failed. It was a fizzle, kind of a cool idea, but no market. On the other hand, they like working with one another enough, do it again. And that's an important additional part of the story. Actually, <laughs> this data center business reminds me, if you're on the MIT campus, and by the way, we're there, kind of in the middle of the oldest part, this dome that we're underneath, you zoom in on the research wing, almost all of us who are MIT people walk around this campus and, and you see buildings that we think numbers, right? This building, 10. It's room 250. Nobody remembers it as Huntington Hall, which is the name on the door, even though Huntington was an entrepreneur, an investor, a donor, a philanthropist. Yeah. All these buildings actually have names, but most people don't remember or know that these are the sources of the money that the donors who donated those buildings, uh, uh, you know, that's how they made their money, as entrepreneurs. So fast forward to the ultimate punchline for many of you, if you're a successful venturer, you become uh, a Van of a Bush, and you founded Raytheon back in the day, or you are Cecil Green of Green Building Green, and you built up Texas Instruments. All right, so when you walk around the MIT campus, frozen in concrete are, in fact, sort of the ultimate pay it forwards, the ultimate philanthropic feedback to this place uh, as evidence of their entrepreneurial action. There are many others, but I give you those as sort of a, sort of a taste. Because beyond startups, founders end up playing lots of roles. And by the way, this is you in your future, but you today should be seeking many of these people out advisors, potential investors, and so forth. So let's talk a little bit about that. Oh, ha -ha. in case you don't want to be philanthropic, <laughs> buy an island and chillax. Yeah, venture networking. Let's talk uh, how to do this practically, because you need a whole pile of people. And if you're anything like me, it's work to schmooze. And you don't do it voluntarily without a really good reason. So <clears throat> yeah, it's work. Um, I, I, I came to realize the hard way that, that you never know when serendipity will strike. So maximizing your odds of serendipity is essential to this game. Almost everybody is one or two or maybe three or four degrees of separation from something or someone or some resource you need uh, or really seek. It could be an answer to a question, do people want this product? It could be a potential first customer. It could be a potential investor. Many, a long list. So when you're talking to somebody, if you can summarize the essence of your idea, not in glorious detail, but in punchline, a few words, and the, it gets a rise out of them, they, they get excited enough to say, ooh, have you met so-and-so? You know you're onto something. Because the have you met so-and-so is, is a tip that you have just been sort of bequeathed for free. So, so, so look, do yourself a favor. Take notes. If you're going to show up at some schmooze gathering and, and then say, hey, by the way, can you send me an email with everything you just told me right, to an advisor or a potential advisor? That's a non-starter. Somebody tries that on me. I'm like, are you kidding? You should have taken notes. And, and you know, you can bust out your smartphone and start pre pretending like you're taking notes, but that usually doesn't really fly. All right? It's better to, to be a little bit more subtle. You know, pencil and paper actually probably work better in this regard. But in any case, in the moment when you're talking to somebody, if they give you a tip, take note. And some people say, well, you know, I'd want to give my idea away. I hear you, and it's true that some people sometimes are unwise to say too much about what they're onto. But most people can say at least what the potential solution, um, what, what, what if they're successful, 
would it achieve in the world? So for example, you heard earlier, uh, alternative way of generating hydrogen without the polluting techniques of today. Like, he didn't say how he was going to do it. In fact, that's the, the gold, right? That's why there's an, there's an intellectual property case. MIT's licensing office is going to file for patents, et cetera. But he did say why another person should care about it and get me, anyways, excited enough to say, ooh, that's a good idea. You should do it. <laughs> so being able to sum up the domain you're interested in without giving away anything really proprietary or secret, you should get good at that. And if you don't know how to do it, I mean, this is exactly the sort of thing that you can go to a venture mentoring person and get advice on, or talk to one of us. Right? Practice that. And practicing your pitching is, is generally a wise idea. We'll have another session all about pitching. But realize that, that the idea of a venture pitch is, is actually not a monolithic, you know, the one pitch you will do. It, it's actually an, a, a portfolio of things that you might say depending on who you're talking to. In a schmooze gathering context, you may say some sort of just summary essence. Oh, petrochemicals technology. And if somebody has something to say about that, they'll want to know more. What you're looking for is the hook. What's the minimum viable hook that gets the person to say, tell me more? I'm, that's exciting or that's interesting. And there's many versions of that, right? It can get more expansive if you have more time. Or if they ask questions, you can then follow up with more details. So this business about practicing your pitch actually is central to the, the act, the art of, of networking, of schmoozing with a purpose. OK. Yeah, specific stuffs. Um, it's true that it's pretty easy for people to, 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 to message and, and at least do that, right? Get their email, get their contact, trade, you know, be LinkedIn exchange. But it's also worthwhile to be analog, to have an analog backup, so a contact card. A lot of undergrads have said, well, yeah, I'm not in business. What are you talking about business cards? They say, ooh, I didn't say business card. It's a contact card. Everybody should have a contact card. You know, and if you don't have a contact card, get a blank card. I actually bought a pile of blank cards at one point and gave it to a billionaire who'd lost his card. He just didn't bring his cards because he's a zillionaire. And he said, this is genius. I'm going to give blank cards. And anybody who wants to follow up, they can take notes on my contact info. I'm like, wow, that is arrogant. But you've earned it. <laughs> you've earned it. You are now a zillionaire, and you can get away with that kind of thing. I, on the other hand, can't. So I give you a normal contact card with my photo on it, because then it reminds you, who the hell were you talking to? Huh? Yeah. The other important, I told you about pitch variants. I think in schmooze events, <clears throat> if you're like me, and, and if, you're, if you love this stuff, great, more power to you. But if you don't, one of the easiest things to do is to figure out who's in charge, who's the host, the obvious, and ask them, like, listen, who, as a minimum, should I meet in this room? And the host is either going to know you, because they invited you, or they're going to say, well, what do you really most care about? Because they're smart. They're a host. They're going to want the minimum useful thing to be able to say to somebody else and say, ooh, you two know each other? If you don't, you should because you both have this common interest. Or you know, he's working on this, and you've done something along those lines. And did you notice what I just did? I, as the host, may not remember who the name of the person that I invited. Because <laughs> you know, faces, names, it's terrible. And I may not remember the name of the person that I want to make the introduction to. But that doesn't matter. You could do something as simple as saying, do you two know each other? Because the natural social grace of the people involved is to say, oh, I'm so-and-so. And, and people self-introduce. So, and if you forget names in the final analysis, bite the bullet and say, I'm sorry, what, remind me your name. And if you're apologetic, almost everybody forgives you for just forgetting, even if your name is something very simple. One tactic that's sometimes wise is to say, what's, remind me of your email address, because that'll give you a clue. And then they say, oh, it's my name at MIT. <laughs> Sometimes work. Yeah, OK. The other important thing is that almost everybody's follow-up is some kind of message, either a message on LinkedIn or a message, you know, whatever, chat platform you prefer, or the old backup email. Problem with emails is on the receiving side, overload. So to differentiate, you want to do a number of smart moves. Number one, subject line. That subject line 
provides super context for the email. It's in your favor. Say, follow up to last night's schmooze gathering regarding key contact. You know, some, something descriptive enough. Could be follow up around a date for a formal follow uh, another meeting. Don't say future meeting in the subject line. Say meeting on such and such. More detail in the subject line, the better. And then writing a, an email that, that, that gets to the point quickly. And, and if necessary, if it's, for example, a, an email, if you introduce me to a third party, my follow-on email should, should be a reminder. Oh, I was introduced by so-and-so. I'm currently working on, and then you have two options. One is the essence of the thing that you're working on, the idea that you have. Two is your, your affiliation of highest credibility. I am an employee at BU in the Tech Transfer Center. I am uh, currently working as an engineer at Big Co. But thinking of uh, pushing into this, this compelling new direction. Whatever gives you the greatest credibility, right? So MIT people, it's like I'm working on my final year of my doctoral program in chemical engineering on this game-changing petrochemical process. Right? That's a huge credibility boost on five levels. Final year, serious program, top school, that kind of thing, thrown into one sentence or even a phrase. Is, is, it's not bragging, it's, it's telling the person who's receiving your email why they should bother reading further, and, and, and for that matter, replying enthusiastically. And, and having a long stack of things that you want accomplished by that first email is usually unwise. You just want to maximize the chance of a reply. If you have this long list of things that you're expecting your recipient to do, that's usually a non-starter, because they'll put it on the stack and say, I'll deal with this later. So being wise in how you craft your, your connections, your context is, is important. All right, where? Well, a whole slew of places. I gave you a clue about that from where all these various founders found each other. But you know, we're in a fantastically rich environment for, for connectivity. And this January month, I mean, there's another week and a half in MIT's independent activities period. If you haven't mined the IEP guide online for the stuff you think is interesting, uh, you're crazy. I mean, this is free and available, accessible to essentially everybody. Uh, and that includes a lot of extracurricular things, hackathons. The ARVR hackathon was this past weekend. There's another couple coming up in the, in the remaining chunk of, of January, and there's more of, of, uh, coming in early, early September. And those are almost invariably open to a much larger audience than just formally registered MIT students. OK. I'll leave this in the notes, but the point is from large to small, for people who are just early days at thinking about what they're doing, to people who have their act a little bit more together, to even those who are doing it again, there is an array of stuff available for people to tap into. And there's now more and more sort of uh, Boston Metro entrepreneurial sites of some note that, that point, especially at the, the chronological things, what's happening when. You know, one of our alums, actually a winner of the MIT 100K, now runs the Biotech Tuesdays. Every month, different biotech schmooze gathering. Uh, another former alum winner started Connect Providence. These kind of schmooze gatherings in different geographies and across different technology sectors are everywhere. And most important, Thursday nights at the Cambridge Innovation Center. I mean, it's just across the street, right? It's a five minute walk from where we are. So certainly take advantage of things like that. MIT spun out this engine, which is not just money for tough tech ventures, but it's actually also a whole program of entrepreneurial events and activities. It's not just MIT, Harvard, up the river, there, iLab, is hosts a whole pile of things. I mean, it's especially for Harvard-related people, but the key point is that if one person on your team is a Harvard person, well, then you're in. And they're incredibly useful and helpful. And go to the West Coast, and I just give you Stanford as one example, but, but look, it's, everybody has figured this out. So they're all encouraging and supportive, and you need to just figure out where you want to be geographically and tap in to the things that are playing out there. Okay, let's talk about classes and clubs. Here's just a sense of the landscape of MIT entrepreneurial support. I especially point your attention to the bottom line, which is the student-run clubs, because they're the ones that are sort of, in some sense, ahead of the game. Every interesting arena of technology venture action that MIT has dealt with in the last quarter century has been led by the students. Huh? 
It was the energy club founded by the students that was before the energy initiative. That was the sustainability group that was well before the sustainability efforts at Sloan and in the rest of MIT, and the list goes on. So the student-driven things are important. On the other hand, MIT is not asleep at the wheel. As an institution, we now have, for those who care about entrepreneurship in developing countries, the Legatum Center. For those who are thinking about entrepreneurship as alums and in various geographies, Enterprise Forum. And actually, let me spotlight a few of those a bit more. Classes, these action labs where you learn by doing, are everywhere from bulk of MIT, which is engineering. You learn engineering through project classes as much as you do through theory all the way through a whole slew of business-related things. These red ones are the ones I could teach, but that's just a small subset of the totality that you can take advantage of. There's a ton of creative places around campus. I already mentioned MITRE's, uh, but it's also the research labs, and poking your nose into those, if they're relevant, is, uh, you know, it can be in your interest, but you want to do it wisely. You don't want to just show up, sort of crash the party, trespass. You want to figure out who in that lab is potentially most friendly and relevant to you. And often that's the doctoral student, or better yet, the postdoc, who has a little bit more time, because they've already done their PhD, and now they're thinking, what's next? MITRES, this is the one of the dozens of makerspaces on campus. Um, perhaps most famous for being the birthplace of the first consumer 3D printing company, Z Corporation, but many other things, including our own how Tunes was born there. And hackathons, right? There's going to be a hackathon for inclusivity. I already told you about the VRAR hackathon. There's a whole slew of these things. And by the way, what's brilliant about a hackathon, it's just a day to three days, more or less, of quick and dirty prototyping and getting to know other people, right? That's the whole point. It's a lightweight mechanism to see whether you are compatible with one another. And if you are, then you double down and do something else. If you aren't, then you simply say, hmm, nice to have met you and move on. Yeah, social infrastructure, not just the MIT campus pub, but the Cambridge Innovation Center's Venture Cafe. Use all the power tools at your disposal. Realize that everybody will search you one way or the other, certainly on LinkedIn, but, I'll, but also just generally. So do it for yourself, right? Don't, be, don't let it be a surprise. If there's stuff online that you need to have an answer to or, or get rid of uh, where that possible, you ought to, or at least frame how people perceive you uh, digitally, and use the, the, the vast array of tools. Everybody who has been to any college should tap into your own alumni network around things like geography of interest, or industry sector of interest, or company of interest. A company where they're working may be a potential customer for you, and one of the easiest ways in is to have a friendly contact. And we're in an incredible geography. This near neighborhood to MIT there's several thousand companies, big and small, across multiple industry sectors. It's just it's epic. You know, first customer for many of the venture ideas that you have is probably just down the street, or at least the person who's willing to give you some feedback on it. I mean, that's certainly true with a lot of, anybody who's doing tools to service the biotech industry, I mean, this is, this is you know, like shooting fish in a barrel. There are 100 plus companies within a 10 minute walk of this building near us. Okay. Biomedical life sciences, cl supercluster, clean tech supercluster, lots and lots of sectors. People forget. There's a huge shoe and apparel cluster in Boston. That's legacy from previous industry. The fact that the textile industry was heavily New England still endures. Robotics and automation. I, I mean, there's more robocos, like AI robotics companies in this metro area, arguably denser than almost anywhere else on the planet, except possibly Silly Valley or Pittsburgh. Yeah, and this is the most epic of them all. It's a map of Boston, greater Boston, but all the colored splotches are the universities in the neighborhood. And this is incredible. This is why Boston is the Athens of America. Everybody ought to know at least one or a few people from each of these other schools both staff and students and alum, that trifecta alike. Because this is a magnet that draws talent from around the planet. And if, if you, for example, I have the students who want to do venture in, in India. I'm like, well, I'm, talking to the, 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 I'm going to the India conference, which is in a month and change here. I was like, well, have you met the 
key people at Thai or the key people at BU who are leaders of their entrepreneurial. They're all diaspora Indians. In other words, don't be limited to your narrow institutional affiliation. Think big. MIT runs a network of distributed enterprise forums around the world. We've got just this is one slice of alum companies from one of my classes. The point is all these entrepreneurs who sat in your seats are going to be the most friendly to you saying, hey, I want to do a venture that's in your neighborhood. Or I even want to clone your venture, just apply to another geography. I mean, they're going to be friendly to all of that, some more than others. But the point is, this is easy to find and highly in your interest. And who else besides co-founders and other members of the team? Well, <clears throat> I would argue the distributed team includes a lot of people who've got more experience than you do. So who's that on the left? Young Steve Jobs, back in the Apple II days. Actually, this is probably the transition to the Macintosh. And who's he talking to? Bob Noy. This is the founder of Intel, right? a previous generation of category killer venture in Silicon Valley. Well, fast forward, who's Zuck talking to? Uh, yeah, old Jobs, right before he passed away from the cancer. But this phenomenon is incredibly powerful. Now, you may not tap into Noyce is now dead, or Jobs is now dead, or Zuck for that matter, but who's your equivalent experienced advisor who can help you out? And, and I think this is not just a company thing. In other words, it wasn't just Zuck sitting there talking to Jobs about, hey, how do I grow this social network business? It's about personal advice. And I think everybody ought to Maybe there's overlap in who the advisors are, but everybody ought to have a personal board of advisors, people who you can count on to go reach out to when things are tough, where you've got a key cusp point and you have to make hard calls, where you're having troubles in the company and you can't talk with people who are your co-founders or whatever. You need to have neutral, but, or at least motivated to help you, not necessarily neutral. Motivated to help, neutral in the sense that they won't do you harm, but motivated to help you advisors on the outside. And it's better not to hunt them hunt for them when you need them, but to prepare and anticipate for when you will need them in the future. And then, of course, there's the company version of that. Sometimes this is formalized. You have a board of directors. That's a very formal legal thing. But a lot of times you'll see, especially biotech companies, have a board of scientific advisors or a board of clinical advisors. And some companies even a board of business or market customer segment advisors. All of those, that you, most of the times people don't formalize it quite so much, but it's in your interest to be thinking about that. And by the way, it's often easier to ask for advice than money. So if you have a hard time valuing your company or pitting people down for an investment, saying, look, I'd love to hear your reaction to this, is a first step towards them converting into, you know, I might want to support you, I want to put that on this financially, or rope in my wealthy friends and others to consider investing in you. And then there's a whole stack of others that matter. One of the powerful benefits of participating in Mass Challenge or MIT's 100K or Harvard's President's Innovation Challenge or whichever you're connected to is that you are, are, are almost personally introduced to a whole slew of people who are potential legal advisors, the full stack. Uh, and they often help in the beginning for free or for deferred compensation. And when you have no money, because you're getting going, the words free or deferred, you should like. Yeah. And that landscape looks complicated, but in fact, it's segmentable. Uh, now, you never know when you too may become an advisor. So here's me in the middle. After these three win the runner-up in the uh, competition maybe a dozen years ago, and I'm there because I introduced them. This is the one on the right said, hey, I'm looking for somebody with some business snaps who also understands this enabling technology. And that was Jason Fuller, the one on the left, who I had known years before because of his work as a doctoral student in Bob Langer's lab. So I made the connection. That kind of stuff happens all the time. I just give you one example saying, this is, this is what I mean by serendipity. Is I was one of the advisors hanging out at the Schmooze gathering, and those, they came up to me and asked a question. I'm looking for X. All right. I think the key point here is 
the term due diligence is often used by investors to talk about their consideration on wh whether they should invest in you. But I su suggest that you should do the same thing on them. So for example, doing due diligence on a potential investor means being sure to talk to your peers who they've already invested in before. In other words, the founders of companies that are in their portfolio of investments. And, and that's on the investment side. Actually, it's, it's also important on each other. Now, I'm not saying hire the private investigators and do a background check on your potential partners. But listening for red flags, not just in your direct engagement, but, but reputational red flags that you hear rumors, whispers. Now, a lot of people don't like to talk bad about others, and I completely understand that. But a person's unwillingness to talk about another or to not be enthusiastic and supportive of another can be a clue that there's more there. And so it's up to you to be paying attention to these early indicators. Because in the beginning, in engaging with others, everybody's on best behavior. So you really have to look for, for where things go wrong. And one useful way to get to know each other is to write stuff together. The easiest thing is market research or competitive analysis or see who else is doing something in the sector or slice and dice the world of who, who are the, the current companies that are in this landscape. Who are the potential customers for what we're thinking of doing? Who's already doing? Those kind of tasks are central to the writing of a plan, but they're relatively lightweight. And if, if you agree with one another to do this task, and then one of the other person doesn't deliver, well, you have an instant red flag. It's like, wait a minute, this is the easiest possible thing to start with, and you couldn't deliver on that? That's what I mean by um, testing the waters with one another. And furthermore, when you do end up writing a plan, do it together. Don't outsource it to just one of the people. And be really thoughtful about how do you convey the essence of all these people that you've roped in in their best possible light? What, what is it about them that would be impressive to a reader? OK. Yeah. It's like getting married. Not literally in a romantic sense, but you're, you're, you're really going to be spending a huge fraction of your time with one another. And so all the things that you would do in, in understanding and trusting and building confidence in your relationship, you should do here. Um, among the things that are most important on this slide is the middle stress test. Seeing how people behave, not when things are going well, but when deadlines are high, when the pressure is on, when the workload is too much, seeing how people behave then. The sooner you can get to know each other through that harsh lens, the better. Because if they can deliver the goods when the times are tough, then you have that much more confidence that they'll, they'll be able to continue going forward. Let's um, be very practical about that. For the purpose of a class project like what we have, those of you who are doing it for credit, I, the, the extent of your commitment is just cranking on something for the remaining week and a half. For those of you doing a full semester class, right, the duration of your commitment is three months. You ought to be able to agree to work on a project together for that chunk of time. And even if you end up hating each other, just finish and then call it a day. Things like extracurriculars, entrepreneurship competition has multiple phases typically. Like each one of those phases is orthogonal to the next. You can enter multiple times with different teams. You can shake up the team in between. And people should be friendly to that. The unwise thing to do is continue when it's not going well. It's better to break apart earlier rather than later. And, and also to do these kind of test things with an understanding that, that it's win-win or no deal. Both parties have to want to continue doing it, otherwise the deal's off. It can't be that one person is imposing themselves on the other. Now, of course, there are some who will interpret this in extreme ways. So let's talk about beyond these phases of commitment. So escalation, iterate, get to work with one another, then dial it up when you've gone in your confidence. You can use these mechanisms of the academic environment to your advantage here. Research in labs, class projects, extracurriculars especially. Uh, how does it go wrong? Well, 
one of the ways that I hope people will be wiser after today's session is, is sooner or later having a conversation around, sooner before later, I hope, having a conversation about what happens when things go wrong. Can we agree on how we disagree? If we can't come to a conclusion together, can we agree now on who we'll go to or what mechanism we'll follow in order to resolve our dispute? Because the harshest case is we just fall apart and we split and we are angry at each other. Can we come up with alternative ways? Because there's a lot of ways that things go wrong. And here's just a few. Let me give you some examples. This is the hardest thing for many organizations to deal with because the historic precedent is all over the place. Who gets what? And we'll have another talk about that under legal night, or yet another talk about that under the financing night with, with Charlie. We'll have another talk about that on the financing panel. And we'll have yet another finale talk about that with Yonald showing what happened to the equity stake of all of the co-founders of our live case study. Okay, so we're going to revisit this a lot because this is one of the big killers for dis and, and sources of, of great disagreement among founders. And we've got, in our own MIT community, a huge range. Amar Bose owned essentially everything. Uh, the the E-Ink, Virtual Ink case, is actually equal modulo a little bit. I think Yonald was a little bit more, uh, but modest. And then the vast majority are mixes, usually with the more experienced person or the CEO, the one who everybody rallies around, having a bigger stake than the others. And invariably, having some mechanism to say, let's, let's allow people to prove they're serious enough to stick with this for at least a minimum chunk of time, usually a year, sometimes more, sometimes less. And if one or more parties in the founding team leave early or prematurely, there's some scheme where there's a reasonable either buyback or clawback scheme so that the company hasn't given all the stock to a, a, a founder who's no longer performing. And that's a, a reasonable thing to agree on, especially before you've created any value, because there's less to argue about. Then there's another important nugget, which is there's a lot of people who like to be, have founder status without even owning anything. They just want to have been present at the creation. They're willing to do all sorts of volunteer help. Just say, yeah, I helped found that company. I told you about Bob Metcalf and 3Com. Yes, he roped in all these fraternity brothers, but actually, it turns out only half of them were serious enough to stick with the company. And the ones who actually created value were the founding employees, the subsequent early hires, who actually were far more important than those early founders. So Metcalf, when he talks about who was a founder, he's actually far more embracive. He acknowledges the people who were there in the beginning, but especially salutes the extended network of people who made the, the company real. Because if you pin them down, as I did, he said, well, look, in the, in the narrow analysis, I'm the founder of 3 com But in the larger analysis, there's these concentric circles of people who could be, deserve to be called founders. And that founder status may matter for a lot of people. So, all right, here's a disastrous failure story. I don't want to go into it for time, but it's these two font designers. You know, they do things like Helvetica, or those, they were the designers of stuff like that. They had a verbal agreement. One would join the other, they would merge their intellectual property, and they would create a joint company together. Problem is, it was left verbal. And it, the, this is the verbiage from the lawsuit about the split. And we're talking about acrimonious stuff being hurled by one party against the other and being rejected. Mrs. Venture Divorce, it's horrible. So the degree to which you can come up with a prenup have agreed on how to disagree, or agreed on how to resolve issues, and pinned it down in writing uh, soon enough. And it doesn't mean now, while you're in class or extracurricular, while you're in an academic environment, but either before or at the time of incorporation, you should have hashed out all these issues, had these kind of tough conversations, so that it's, not, it's, it's still not a bone of contention when you're, when you're, you're in, the, in the, well, let me give you some examples, huh? because it can get really bad. All company, half of these companies were sitting in your seats in years past. The other half were either winners or runners-up in MIT's entrepreneurship competition. Uh, the winning co, bottom case, <coughs> they agreed verbally that all the prize winnings would go into the company. But then when they won the prize, 
one of the three said, oh, actually, I want the money. And it's a $30,000 prize. I want my $10,000. And it was like, oh, what do you mean? This, we disagreed. This, had, this brought the lawyers in. And it required a rule change in 100K. Now you have to specify. Is it the individuals who get the money and are thus taxed? Or is it the company that has to be incorporated and formalized, potentially prematurely? It's a real case. Another one, soft picks. CTO and CEO met each other in class. First investor, later, banded together with the CTO and said, the CEO isn't cutting the mustard. We need to get rid of him. CEO discovered that the hard way by being locked out at a key juncture. And this, by the way, was something the CTO later really, really regretted because he was being played by the VC. He didn't have enough perspective on what was going on. The um, soft botics case is particularly troubling. Three doctoral students who had worked multiple years in a row on different venture concepts actually did really well in one of the years of the 100K entrepreneurship competition. We're starting the company, thought they'd, they'd been office made and said, you know. And then um, in the venture capitalist office where they're about to sign the term sheet, one of the three says, you know, this isn't what I want to do. And the other two, what the hell are you talking about? How can you at this late hour make such a drastic you know, shift? Couldn't we have talked about this before we came here? Yeah, excellent point. In retrospect, those other two had clues and inklings, but they just they, they didn't, didn't follow up on those clues and inklings. So this, I mean, in other words, I'm suggesting this is an example of both, A, the power of having a culture of good conversation amongst the founders and clarifying potential bones of contention, but B, realizing that in the final analysis, even people who you know really well may completely surprise you. So there's no planning for that except uh, to, as much as possible, have mechanisms like the clawback, like the founder dispute resolution. Yeah, in the... Um, yeah. This idea person owns all was my pain in the first of the two years I ran the 100K. The winner of that year had this high concept, microwaves to sterilize medical devices, big idea, uh, but couldn't make it. I mean, he was a biologist. He couldn't actually do the electrical engineering required. And was so adamant about owning everything that he ultimately imploded as a, as a venture concept. It's disastrous, it's really sad, right? A really good idea killed because one person wanted to own 100% of nothing. Yeah. <clears throat> For how-tunes, we, we didn't do trusted third-party arbitration or find some person to agree with, we just used rock, paper, scissors. <laughs> and agreed that whatever the outcomes of using this mechanism, you know, two out of three, uh, so that's how we're going to do it. Now, we never had to actually, <laughs> we came close a couple times. We never had to, act, to do one of these for real, although I practiced a lot with the computer simulation. <laughs> yeah. We'll have another night on negotiations where, where not all of these, but a good, goodly chunk of the high concepts you should be thinking about will be played out. We'll do a role-playing game that night. Uh, yeah, OK. And by the way, Winning a competition, right? this, is, this is the grand prize track winner, the two guys, Colin, John, they won. They had a huge idea, teleoperated surgical robots. So a doctor could operate on a patient who was inside a CAT scanner. The doctor could see what they were doing. Right? It's an amazing idea. Colin had built prototypes. John had his MBA, he was running Global Startup Labs. It was a big deal, he was a real organized person. Turns out, it fizzles as a company. Lots of reasons. It's premature and this and that. But those guys part a company on good terms. And both ended up doing amazing things. John started Mass Challenge, which is arguably the MIT 100K, spun out to become a regional and now international uh, accelerated, probably arguably the biggest on the planet. And Colin 
said, you know what, I actually don't want to do ventures only. I want to be an academic. So he's now a Wies Institute professor, you know, bio-inspired engineering, Connor Walsh, John Harthorne. And a venture concept is still a good one. <laughs> it's this interesting uh, situation. My point to you is that, that splitting apart, not found in the company, does not have to be all these negative, bad divorce things. OK, final things in the remaining minute. Um, early days, everybody is a CXO. There's probably one or two, sometimes more, who are the CEO, but at least one. But almost everybody takes on different roles. You know, sales and marketing, business development, money side, you know, inward facing, outward facing, operations oriented, whatever. You don't have to call yourself grandiose titles, especially in the beginning, but y'all ought to have some sense of who's responsible for what. And that early relationship that the founders have with each other really sets the tone for all the other people who, if things go really, really well, and you're in a growth venture, you will be recruiting and hiring in people. Because at key thresholds, you know, 100, 150 people, people stop knowing everybody else in the company. Right? Before then, it's a, small, it's a big extended family. It's like a clan. But, but the cultural tone that you set in the beginning either scales or doesn't with you. And so thinking about that up front, saying what kind of a company do we hope to have? I mean, Herb Kellner, the reason, Joe, well, one of the reasons I'm happy Joe uses Southwest Example is because you read the, the uh, obituaries for the founder, and, and none of it is about his technical innovations in aerospace. Like, it's all about the incredible customer orientation that he built into the, into the Southwest uh, employee base from day zero. So you think about what your version of that is. You don't have to be a jokester like Keller, but you do have to think about your own tone. Um, <clears throat> and look for peers. Like if you have a company that you admire, try to, try to disentangle what are those underlying principles that, that are powering that company. Or if you have other business leaders who you admire or don't, try to figure out what aspects you like or dislike and mimic the ones you like and, and try to prune the ones you don't. OK, finally, <clears throat> you're here in this session and hopefully the, the remaining four nights. Um, and you're, you're in, this, in this small temporary community. But as Joe has pointed out, you know, we like to hear from you going forward. Because invariably, there's something that either we can do or vice versa. And, and so not just right now helping each other, but staying supportive of, of your peers is a useful thing to keep in mind. That, that, that kind of paying it forward and being helpful to other people ends up bearing fruit hugely because you, your reputation grows and people are more willing to help you. Or if they know what you're interested in, they'll want to follow up and say, oh, by the way, FYI, do you know about this new venture? Or do you know about this other? and make the kind of recommendations and connections that are crucial to you, including potential teammates. And that includes volunteering to be a temporary teammate, meaning you may know you don't want to do a venture. The timing is wrong, whatever. But you're willing to help out for a period of time and learn along the way. And that's another important way to, to help one another. And participate in the stuff that's free and easy for many or most of you, which is to say that the various competitions. You have to have at least one member on the team with an MIT affiliation to participate in the MIT competition. Ditto Harvard, ditto every other contest in Boston Metro that's run by a university. But none of that is true for things like the Dell Social Innovation Challenge, or the Mass Challenge uh, competitions, or things that are for more serious, right? Techstars or you name it. They, they're agnostic to affiliation. You're eligible already. And so be motivated to participate in those. OK, that's it. I hope that's uh, helpful. Yeah. Question or two? Questions, yeah. <laughs> OK. Yes. Kind 
places to place oneself in a schmooze gathering. Uh, I personally like to be able to have an eye on the door, who's coming in, because you know you never know. Uh, so as a default, to have that in mind. Some people say don't hang out by the bar. <laughs> I'm a little partial to that. Uh, <laughs> but the key is don't block the bar. <laughs> and, and also, uh, it's a rule that's less about geophysics, like where in the room, but about the host or the connectors in the room. If you can identify who those people are, hanging out near them is better than hanging out away from them. And then what you don't, shouldn't do is, uh, is th there's invariably somebody who's extremely popular. Being part of the scrum around them is a you know, waste of everybody's time. So I would suggest look for the, for the um, ideally with an introduction from a host or somebody like that, but look for the people who are, who are equally at work in a shoes gathering. Any other questions? Final question? Yes, sir. Do you want to give your opinion on reserving equity for future founders or investors? The idea that oh, you yeah. have to people, but you have a pool to get out. Which could include a pool to people who are unusually contributory but were under. Yeah, uh, excellent point. This was about the um, not just founder shares, but reserve shares for future members of the team, which would be not only something that's brought up but it features prominently in Yonald's finale remarks because he illustrates the strengths and weaknesses of that, and in particular, the pushback that you get from some investors. So I, I didn't cover it today because it will, I know it will be covered in these two following evenings. When's uh, Charlie night? It's both next week, I think. I think next Thursday. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Wednesday. Wednesday. So the end of next week is, is where these, especially these share share stake and equity pool related questions will be especially addressed. Okay, anything else? Otherwise, excellent to see you all. See you tomorrow night, Joe, yeah, for what? Yeah, just one quick thing. The, the segue tomorrow night is the, there'll be a panel at the beginning uh, with Ken Zolot uh, called The Founder's Journey. And these will actually be people that have launched companies directly after graduating from MIT in the last few years following wonderfully to uh, Yost's presentation on people issues. And then the second half, uh, I'll be doing uh, you know, legal issues for uh, starting companies, and including intellectual property and equity issues and other things. So we'll see you tomorrow. Hopefully the rain will uh, not leave us all swimming.